Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's sixth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Technology, chaired by Councilmember Peter Koo, and Councilmember Powers is also here with us today. Um, today we will hear from the Department of Information, Technology, and Telecommunications and the Fire Department. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, Committee Councils, Rebecca Chasen, Stephanie Ruiz, and Noah Brick, Deputy Directors, Regina Parada Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads, John Russell and Isha Wright, Financial Analyst, Sebastian Bacci, and Anna Maria Camello Vega, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. DeWitt's official, excuse me, DeWitt's fiscal 2020 executive budget is $684 million, a $17.3 million increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. The council commends the agency for heeding its call to find savings and efficiencies in the budget. At the recommendation of the council, the administration achieved a savings of $180,112 through right-sizing software and hardware maintenance contracts citywide. It also adjusted the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment Film Incentive Fund budget to reflect actual costs, which resulted in a realized savings of $446,000 in fiscal 19 and a baseline savings of $1 million beginning in fiscal 2020. Dewitt was also able to achieve savings by expanding the agency's partial hiring freeze. The council recommended partially freezing 40 vacant positions for fiscal 2020 in order to generate approximately $3 million in savings. Dewitt went beyond the council's recommendation and permanently eliminated 72 vacant positions, which will result in budgetary savings of $5.1 million in fiscal 2020 and baseline savings of $6 million beginning in fiscal 2020. Although much progress has been made in achieving savings in Dewitt's executive budget, the Council believes that additional savings can be realized. At today's hearing, I look forward to learning on how the agency plans to further achieve savings while addressing other budgetary issues raised in the Council's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Peter Koo, for his statement, and then we'll hear from Do It Commissioner Samir Sani. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's joint executive budget hearing with the Committee on Finance and the Committee on Technology. My name is Peter Ku. I'm the chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to recognize that we are joined by council members Holden in our committee, and others will on the way. And also want to thank Chair Drum for co-chairing today's hearing with me. First and foremost, I want to express my disappointment that the fiscal 2020 executive budget in general does not include the majority of the council's recommendations set forth in the preliminary budget response. Nevertheless, I along with my colleagues will push the administration to ensure that the fiscal 2020 adopted budget includes the leads and interests of the city and the programs they fund. Today, we will be hearing testimony from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also long as do it, regarding their fiscal 2020 uh, executive budget. 
which totals $684 million. This is an increase of $17.3 million when compared with the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. This increase is a result of funding allocated to the City uh, Cyber Command for staffing purposes and for the purchase of cyber defense tools, the majority of which come in the form of software licenses. The committee would like to know more about the cyber defense projects funded in the Dewey budget and how these projects will protect the city from further cyber threats. The committee would also like to discuss budgetary priorities that were listed in the preliminary budget response that were not included in the Dewey budget, including creating new UAs for the purpose of uh, budgetary transparency. Lastly, I want to hear more about uh, NYC win and the issues surrounding it since our preliminary budget hearing. On April 6, 2019, uh, NYC win had issues for about 10 days due to a GPS rollover which affected the operations of multi-city uh, agencies. VMO, remote access to the city traffic, uh, to, to the remote, earth, remote access to the city's traffic lights were, uh, were cut. Traffic cameras were shut down and other agency technology uh, was unusable. This is unacceptable. At today's hearing, the committee wants to know more about the issues surrounding NYC winds going offline, its contract with Lotto Grumman, and what the department has done to prevent such issue happening again uh, to any of its other IT systems. I would like to thank the Commissioner Samir Sanai and his team for coming to today's hearing. I would also like to thank my staff the staff of the finance division and the committee staff for their help in preparing for today's budget hearing. Thank you. Back to Chair uh, John. Thank you very much, Council Member Ku. We've been joined by M Minority Leader Steve Matteo as well. And I think we've got oh, Robert Cornegie is here also. And I think we've got everybody so far covered. All right. Um, Council, would you swear the panel in, please? Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your information, knowledge, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Hey, Commissioner, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum and Koo and members of City Council Committees on Finance and Technology. My name is Samir Saini. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, otherwise known as DOIT, and New York City's Chief Information Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DOIT's fiscal 2020 executive budget. Uh, with me today, uh, to my right, is John Winker, Associate Commissioner for Financial Services, and to my left, um, Michael Pastor, our General Counsel. Today, it is my pleasure to update the committees on the work that DOIT has been doing and the many exciting things to come uh, in the next year. I'll begin with a summary of DOIT's fiscal 2020 executive budget. Following that, I'll explain how we have realigned our strategic priorities to deliver the best services for our agency customers and, in turn, all New Yorkers. Due its fiscal year 2020 executive budget provides for operating expenses of approximately $684 million, allocating $173 million in personal services to support 1,840 full-time positions and $511 million for other than personal services uh, otherwise known as OTPS. This includes $142 million in intra-city funds uh, transferred from other agencies for services provided. In total, the intra-city funding represents approximately 21% of the total budget allocation. Telecommunications costs represent the largest portion of the intra-city expense, uh, which is projected at $102 million uh, for fiscal year uh, 2019. Do it also generates upwards of 190 million in revenues um, through our franchise portfolio. And I'm proud to share 
that we have identified savings of $14 million for fiscal 2019 and approximately $7 million uh, in savings for fiscal 2020. This meets and exceeds the mayor's call for a program to eliminate the gap or pegs. This is largely a result of savings associated with the higher increase, as well as uh, across the board OTPS accruals and reductions. For fiscal year 2020, DeWitt's budget appropriation decreases by approximately 4.6 million as compared to uh, fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. This decrease is associated with savings that DeWitt and OMB identified during the executive financial plan process. What I've described so far are simply the changes to our budget, but what I want to emphasize is how we are how we've streamlined appropriation will um, how our streamlined appropriation will support all of the work in our purview, including managing technology projects, architecting complex IT solutions, administer uh, administering citywide um, IT service contracts, and that's just to name a few of the dozens of services uh, that we provide for the over 100 uh, governmental entities that rely on these services every single day to keep New York City running. Last year, I briefed the committees on strategic objectives that framed a transformative agenda to improve Do It across the board. I'm proud to say, in working with Do It staff and our agency customers, we have both refined and expanded these objectives and have been working every day towards implementing them. We have been laser focused on improving the customer experience for our agency partners with whom we collaborate to deliver technology that keeps the city running. As citywide CIO, I'm committed to revising DOIT's offerings to better meet agency needs by ensuring the delivery support and continuous improvement of all services available in our service catalog. We are working towards refining our service offerings and tailor uh, tailoring service catalogs for our agency customers. This streamlined approach will help uh, other city agencies achieve their missions and deliver services uh, to New Yorkers in a more efficient and effective way. One important service um, we are offering includes the hosting and safeguarding of many of the city's digital and physical information assets. We strive to further strengthen the reliability, security, and resiliency of these operational services. And to that end, we have been working to align our core network storage and compute infrastructure and associated software to meet uh, industry best practice capacity planning processes. This will ensure that the city makes the best use of these assets for years to come. Another enhancement we are planning uh, to add to our service catalog is the simplification and acceleration of the deployment of applications and software services um, for our agency customers. We have begun to adopt a quote unquote application uh, platform as a service model that will give agencies direct control over their application build, increasing agility, reliability, uh, resiliency, and responsiveness. It will facilitate more effective deployment and quality of applications by reducing the time it takes for an agency to design, build, test, launch, and, and also continuously improve these applications over time. Additionally, our new data governance program will further empower agencies to better share data and connect applications both internally and across uh, government. Under a newly formed data management and integration division I stood up, uh, helmed by Don Sunderland, DOIT's chief data officer. This program will bring together targeted agency leadership to enable agencies to effectively uh, use a, a new modernized uh, citywide data platform to seamlessly uh, enable the ingestion, storage, analysis, sharing, um, um, and, and actions against this data um, for all our agency customers. While this recent development focuses on how cities may better share information across agencies, our most public-facing data sharing effort, of course, Open Data, continues to thrive. This program is a joint effort with the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics the Open Data Portal now boasts over 2,500 data assets, and we continue to expand agency participation and compliance with the Open Data Law. We are pleased to collaborate on the Open Data tr uh, on uh, an Open Data Training uh, with City Council staff um, that we're planning to have earlier, uh, early next month. 
Open data represents one significant conduit through which New Yorkers interact with the city. But we also recognize the importance of, the, of improving uh, the online digital experience for New Yorkers um, through other core uh, New York City digital products. Um, for example, New York City, NYC.gov, uh, NYC Business, and 311, uh, which are all digital offerings um, through which New Yorkers interact with city government. We aim to prioritize and accelerate enhancement of these products with technologies to better analyze, predict, and deliver recommended services and information to New Yorkers. Further, we have launched an improved uh, NYC ID, which allows New Yorkers to use the same, same account uh, to interact with uh, different public-facing websites across agencies. For example, a, uh, a New Yorker can now use the same username and password um, to update their notify NYC alerts um, or apply for benefits through Access HRA. Um, one account for all. This feature will go a long way towards improving how agencies interface and interact um, with, um, with New Yorkers. In addition to these strategic shifts, we continue our vigilant work on matters that directly impact New Yorkers through our cable franchises. DUID has been using every tool at our disposal to ensure our cable franchisees have been uh, remitting re revenue payments accurately. At the preliminary budget hearing, I advised the committees um, about a notice of default we issued to Charter Communications on March 6th as a result of an audit that indicated the company failed to pay the city millions of dollars in advertising revenue. I'm pleased to announce as a result of that notice, Charter agreed to pay the city $4.3 million in two years worth of owed fees. This payment, which was remitted in early April, cures Charter's default. Further, Charter agreed to properly calculate their payments to the city going forward, which will result in approximately 1.5 to 3 million in additional annual revenue. DUIT will continue to exercise its franchising authority to ensure that the city receives the payments we are owed from these multi-million dollar companies who have the privilege of using our public right of way to deliver services to millions of New Yorkers. Finally, I would also like to take this opportunity to address the issue with the city's private wireless network, um, otherwise called NiceWin, and our plan going forward with this network. First, I want to emphasize that at no point was, uh, was, there a pub was the public at risk when this, uh, when this network went down. And this, was, uh, and this did not impact um, most New Yorkers' daily lives. That being said, on April 6th, uh, 6th, a GPS rollover resulted in a technical issue that took down the network um, uh, on that day, but was uh, incrementally restored over a period of 10 days um, uh, past the, the, gen the April 6th um, outage date. The network has been restored and remains in working condition. Fortunately, agencies that were using the network were able to continue oper operating certain functions without significant impact to the public. Staff here at Do It worked tirelessly throughout the outage to get the network back up and running as quickly as possible. But we are focused on moving forward. As we have indicated in prior budget testimonies, we have been in the process of decommissioning the NiceWin network and ending our contractual relationship with the vendor that wholly manages this network, Northrop Grumman. This will intrinsically be a cost savings measure in the multi-millions. Uh, as we have previously announced, this work continues. Keep this in mind, Northrop Grumman is still maintaining and operating the NiceWin network since we must uh, ensure that the agencies who use the network are still, uh, are fully migrated to commercial carriers before we shut it down. We are eager to fully decommission, but we must continue to work with uh, the contractor during this transition period. As we move forward with the process, we will keep the committees informed. With that, I'd be happy to take questions from the committees. Uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to testify before you. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. And I want to start off with nice win. On uh, April 6, 2019, as we know, the New York City Wireless Network crashed for about 10 days before it was up and running again, affecting the operation of multiple agencies. According to several news outlets, the federal government issued a warning a year prior to advising, a year prior advising that the 
uh, that a time counter rollover event could affect GPS-enabled devices like NiceWin. So what steps did you take to prepare NiceWin for this issue, and where did these efforts fall short leading to the crash? Sure. So uh, let me take that in a, in a few parts. So first off, regarding the, um, the notice of the GPS rollover event occurring, um, uh, our agency um, uh, and myself was aware of the GPS rollover event occurring just, just as many uh, just as uh, uh, many other cities, right, uh, uh, private or public sector entities were aware uh, as well. What we weren't aware of was that the GPS module that, again, is part of a decade-old NiceWin network that was stood up in the Bloomberg era, uh, that this GPS module happened to be, um, because of its age, susceptible, right, to, um, uh, to this GPS rollover. Um, change that was, that was deployed that would cause the network to go down. Uh, so Northrop Grumman never informed you of that? We were not informed by Northrop Grumman uh, regarding um, that this, this GPS module being susceptible to the, GP to the GPS rollover event. Now, that, all that said, again, I need to reemphasize that at no time during this outage was there a risk to the public, nor was there major disruption in operations for the agencies that were using the network. Um, we, during the 10-day period uh, post the, the July 6th outage, we worked day in, day out, uh, around the clock um, to restore the network. And, and I want to clarify that the network wasn't reestablished 10 days after. The network was incrementally uh, being stood up over the course of the 10 days because the network is comprised of various nodes, um, uh, 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 network sites across the city, and we worked to st stand those up incrementally over the 10-day period. Were there costs involved with um, the, the, the breakdown? The only cost that we incurred was really internal labor, uh, which is internal city staff um, working, again, tirelessly, around the clock uh, over those 10 days to, to get the network up. In the preliminary budget hearing, you testified that DoIt would use NiceWin's current operating budget to pay for the decommission of NiceWin beginning in June 2020. Can you provide a breakdown of the cost associated with the de decommission of NiceWin, and when will it begin to realize savings? Sure. Um, I'm going to ask uh, John uh, to field that question. John. Good afternoon. I'm John Winker. Yes, beginning in uh, the end of FY20, which is June 2020, we will see uh, sites being taken down and start to see savings related to leases, uh, data circuit costs, um, and primary electricity. Th those are the types of costs we'll, we'll start to see coming down. Mm. Ultimately, when everything is off, we'll be able to decommission all of the the spectrum that we're using to, to, to transmit all the services. Mm. So we anticipate that to take 18 to 24 months. So it, sometime in FY, well, I would say FY23, we'll start to see savings. And any number in terms of what the cost savings will be? Well, as we testified previously, it's going to be in the, in the tens of millions of dollars. Okay. A, uh, on an annual basis? On an annual basis, recurring. In a recent news article, it was reported that DeWitt's urgency to switch over to commercial wireless carriers waned after former DeWitt Commissioner Roast left her position. So since she left, um, what has been done to make this switch, and why were you unable to sunset the system before? Did it have something to do with uh, what you mentioned in your testimony, your contract with Northrop Grumman? No, and, and again, I want to uh, say on the record that, that, that is, that's certainly a false statement. We have not... We have not um, lost momentum uh, in uh, in migrating off the NiceWin network um, to commercial carriers since since and um, the prior commissioner moved on. In fact, if anything, we've been accelerating um, uh, the deployment. Um, so, uh, can you? Uh, yeah. So, are you locked into a contract with Northrop Grumman now? So we have uh, actually, Michael. Do you want to talk about the, the contract? Uh, yes, we have a contract right now, um, um, but when you say locked council member, I mean, I think the, the contract itself is not the thing um, that's keeping us from migration. These things, it's a big project, a project that's been around for a long time. We have plans to migrate, but these things do take some time for the changeover to occur. Mm -hmm. 
So is that like maintenance? Is that what is that what the contract is for now? And, and running the network. And running the and, okay, exactly. running the network. All right. Um, let me just go to another topic: um, special education uh, student information system (CSIS). Uh, I used to be a New York City public school teacher, and am somewhat familiar with the issues regarding CSIS from its start. Mm. Um, the city has announced that, do it, that the DOE will stop using the CSIS system, a centralized online management tool for IEPs and special education records, and will perform such services in-house. However, in a recently issued RFP, DOE was said to be seeking proposals for a new special education data management system to replace CSIS. So have we given up on doing a new system with CSIS in-house and now going to outside vendors for that system? So, so let, me, let me first state that um, DOE, DOE um, and this initiative um, around CSIS is, is being managed by, uh, by that agency, right? Um, and from a technology standpoint, their, their CIO, right, and their IT staff. Um, the involvement. Do I met with some of your staff. Right. Uh, I was going to say. Office? Okay. Go sure. Ahead. I, just, I just want to describe. They wholly, of course, own this, but we are providing advisory, uh, architectural sort of advisory services from our um, from one of our divisions to help support them, right, with um, uh, making the right decisions around what platform they should move to, uh, and adopt to ensure um, uh, that the system meets their 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 short and long term requirements. So when I did meet yeah. with, um, uh, with, with folks from, your, sure. from, from Do It, mm -hmm. um, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, mm -hmm. at that time, Do It was going to revise the system itself. Is that plan completely over now? So we are, we're partnered with DOE on providing advice for them around what we believe the right architecture is for the So they're solution. looking for a new system. They are looking for a new system, and we're simply helping them out with the decision making around that. And uh, you're as working we do with, other with them on that? They've, they actually came to us uh, seeking uh, advisory support uh, around yeah. it, so we're providing that service. Um, do its current year budget uh, includes 5.7 million for tech-related work uh, for CSIS. So is, what's the proposed scope of that work um, for the revisal of that program? Uh, John, can you? Uh, We're pr primarily purchasing consultant services with the, with those funds. So they're outside consultant services. Correct. Do you know if um, one of the purposes of the new RFP is to make it um, so that it communicate with other systems within the DOE? I believe so. Yeah, I I know that for certain. Uh, you, that's one of the do. key one of the key requirements um, for this system, as I remember, in some of the meetings I was in. Um, is interoperability uh, was really the key word, ensuring uh, ease of integration okay. um, uh, of CSIS with other, other DOE uh, systems. It's a key requirement. Has any of your discussions with DOE been around uh, tracking uh, UPK or uh, 3K as well? Uh, so I can't speak to that, um, but I can certainly um, uh, uh, discuss that with my team offline and with DOE and, and get back to you. Yeah, I'm interested in that. I do have a piece of legislation that would, um, is asking DOE to begin to collect that data, and uh, particularly um, because um, oftentimes CBOs are involved in it, and I'm just wondering how the, or what that would look like, um, because they're a little bit organized different than the regular uh, K-12 to, K to programs within the DOE. Understood. I, I can set that up. Okay. Uh, the hiring freeze savings. Do it. We'll realize savings of $5 million in fiscal 2020 by permanently reducing 72 vacant positions. Um, where, were these posi where are these positions allocated? Where were these positions allocated across the agency? And will the reduction of these vacant positions have an impact on do its essential operations? Um, I'm gonna have John uh, field that. Sure. Obviously those vacancies are spread across the whole organization. We're looking at, we're currently assessing where to take those in the most strategic way to avoid impact to operational services. So we'll minimize you, that impact. Will you get back to us on that before we make a decision with the budget? I asked this yesterday from the Department of Buildings because they were given um, a, um, a goal to meet but did not yet know where the cuts were going to come from. And it sounds to me the same for you. 
It is the same. Uh, this was a citywide program in terms of the baseline allocation of these reduc redu reduction in heads, so we are assessing where we're going to take those. Okay, in the so hopefully we'll get that information within the next couple of weeks or so? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment uh, incentive fund savings. In the citywide savings program, do it will realize baseline savings of a million dollars in fiscal 2020 by adjusting the uh, Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment uh, film incentive fund budget to reflect actual expenditures. Although this is a welcome feature included in the budget, the council called for a much larger reduction in the film incentive fund in our response. Have you worked with, um, I don't know what the acronym is, MOME, M-O-M-E, uh, to reduce the funding for the film incentive fund? Well, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment actually worked directly with OMB to come up with that target. Uh, if you have specific questions regarding where they want to implement that reduction, we could certainly take that back to Mom. Okay, and given the magnitude of the state's uh, credit, uh, why do you think the Film Incentive Fund is effective? Has anyone ever conducted an analysis of its efficacy? Again, we could take that back to Mom and have them get back to us. Okay. All right. Look forward to hearing from you on that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair Ku. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Drum. Commissioner, uh, my question, first question to you is on the um, New York City Wireless Network, uh, NYC Wing. On Saturday, April 6, 2019, a GPS will offer created several issues for the network. It took over a week and a half before uh, NYC Wind was fully restored, which is um, acceptable, as it affected multiple agency uh, operations. Furthermore, do it spends up approximately $40 million a year on maintaining this integrated system. So please tell the committee how you plan to move agencies that currently use NYC Wind onto commercial carriers. Can you provide an estimate as to how much this transition would cost? Sure, so, so again, we are, we're aggressively focused on transitioning off of Nice Wind to carrier networks. Uh, we have a, a plan to get, uh, to have all agencies um, uh, leveraging nice wind today onto those carrier networks by next year. Um, we have a, a, a the, the plan um, is is uh, is divided by agency because different agencies have different assets and services that they're they're using nice the nice wind network for. Um, some agencies will get to uh, the carrier networks first, right? Uh, some second, some third. Um, but again, we're we're. We're working very hard with those agencies, right, to um, to accelerate that timeline to get them get them off of Nicewin and and uh, and and then initiate the decommissioning, right, of the Nicewin network itself. Um, so, what was the type of work do the technician did to fully restore MIC win? How much did this cost the agency? So, uh, again, just to uh, reiterate, the only cost that was incurred by the city during the the nice wind outage was internal, uh, internal labor, which is the time of uh, my do-it staff and several other agencies working around the clock, right, um, to incrementally get that network up. That was the only cost. So, uh, what agencies and agency systems were affected by the outage of uh, NYC wind, and how long were these systems offline? So. Uh, the the primary ones, which I think we already we already discussed, was DOT um, uh, with uh, which leverages the Nicewin network for remote control uh, of uh, modifying signal timing um, for all the traffic signals uh, in the city. Also, NYPD leverages the network for a small subset of license plate readers, um, uh, and then a few others. But that was that was really the ex the extent of it. So, please provide a list of agencies that currently use uh, NYC Win, and for what purpose? So I, I don't have that list you with have me. A list? I'm happy to, to share with you uh, uh, the full list of all the agencies mm -hmm. that leverage it and how they and how they leverage it. But again, I'll reiterate: the major users 
um, for the for the network are DOT for remote control of traffic signals, um, also some traffic cameras, NYPD for LPRs, DEP for water meters, and then for some remote sites that we have with parks and rec and, um, and sanitation, they leverage the NICE network as either a backup network for small remote sites they have, um, or or their uh, or as their primary network for these small sites as well. In, that's a, just a quick summary of the major uh, agencies using the network. Mm, were there any other systems that do it uses affected by the GPS rollover? No. No? Uh, what can do it do to prevent the issue, to, pre to prevent this issue from happening in the future? Getting off of NiceWin and getting onto carrier networks, which is exactly what we're doing right now. 10-year-old system, Bloomberg era, we got to get off of it, and that's what we're doing. Okay. So the second set of questions I asked is uh, re related to Link NYC. Uh, mm -hmm. Actual revenue bought by the Link NYC kiosk from 2015 to 2018 shows that the kiosks initially did not sell enough advertising to meet the city bridge minimal annual guarantees of revenues to the city. In fact, between 2015 and 18, actual revenues for the kiosks fell short $20.1 million from what was listed in the minimal annual guarantee in the franchise agreement with City Bridge. In what ways have you worked with City Bridge in order to receive the minimal annual guarantee of revenues from the Link NYC kiosks? Great. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Michael, our general counsel, to, to field that question. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, just one quick um, starting point about the question of actual revenue. So um, there can be confusion as to um, focusing on the revenue of City Bridge, the franchisee, um, because they track their revenue on an April-to-April -April basis. And we obviously from the city government track our revenue from a fiscal year, fiscal year, June to June. If you compare those, it can look like there's a discrepancy when there, when there isn't. Um, with respect to uh, revenue chair, um, you know, from the city's perspective, the revenue requirements are set out in the franchise agreement um, in the minimal, annu minimal annual guarantee. Uh, all those payments have been paid to the city and we would expect that all that all that they will so from the city's perspective from a revenue perspective it's all set out in the in the franchise agreement and that's where our expectations come from the revenue that we will expect to see and have seen already please explain why your revenue projection for lane nyc in fiscal 2019 is 32.3 million dollars while the minimal and your guarantee for fiscal 2019 is $42 million. Yes, Chair. So again, that goes back to the difference between the time, the time of the year, right? So the fiscal year, we'll look at how much the city will get between June and June. Mm -hmm. um, the contract year, minimum annual guarantee that you're seeing, which is pulled straight from the contract itself, has a different time frame. So those numbers will never sync up ident identically because the amount we're getting on a fiscal year basis will look different than a uh, April 1 to April 1 basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, in late April, uh, the NYPD arrested a local man for smashing and vandalizing hmm. 42 Link NYC kiosk displays. Who will be responsible to pay for the repairs of the Link NYC kiosk display? Uh, all costs for the program are borne, in, um, including these costs, are borne by the franchisee City Bridge. So will these calls have an impact on the revenue the city receives from the Link NYC kiosk? It will not, Chair. It will not? No. Right. I should, I should okay. just all, uh, also point out, um, uh, Chair, that it's our understanding that all of the um, damaged uh, ad panels have now been repaired um, by the franchisee mm -hmm. along with its subcontractors. Okay, the, the third set of questions I ask is uh, related to uh, 311, 311 we architecture new needs. The executive plan includes new needs for of $4.6 million for courses related to 311 we architecture program. Can you give the committee an update on the rollout of the new 311 system? Sure, um, and uh, again, I, I shared this, uh, this update in the preliminary budget hearing as well. We're on track for, um, for uh, uh, sunsetting 
the current legacy 311 platform um, uh, and moving to a modern cloud-based uh, platform that's gonna be going live later this year. Um, so the funding that we've, uh, we've asked for is really to support um, uh, that, uh, that effort. Um, it's on track and we're, we're, we couldn't be more excited about, uh, about moving to the, uh, the, new, the new system. So can you provide a breakdown um, uh, what this funding will cover? Are you behind schedule on the project? No, we, we are not behind schedule. Uh, again, I said in the preliminary hearing, and I'll say it again, we're going live later this year. Uh, in terms of breakdown of the funding, I'm gonna ask John to uh, share that with you. Well, it, to summarize it, essentially it's to address changes in uh, enhancements that we've made as we've identified them going through the process of rolling out the project. I can give you the exact breakdown. I have actually a copy with me, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll share that with you separately. Okay. So um, my uh, other question will be, be related to agency legacy systems. In what ways have you worked with the city agencies to transition from using antiquated tech systems like the pension payroll management system, PPNS. So with regard to how do it works with agencies to address legacy uh, applications and to modernize them, um, first uh, let me make clear that the if an agency uh, there's a difference between an agency that hosts its own applications um, within their own environment versus hosting those, those legacy applications within the do-it hosted environment. Um, where an agency has a legacy application um, uh, that's hosted within our data centers, um, we actually work, work with those agencies to first highlight what, what is legacy, what, uh, what legacy components uh, exist within within their applications and then work with them to lay out a strategy for for modernization we're actually doing this very aggressively right now on a number of fronts to evaluate uh, some systems that we have that are operating on legacy operating systems um, or legacy databases um, so uh, uh, to that extent that's what that's how we support agencies um, to address legacy that's man that's within the do it hosted environment outside of that, we uh, uh, agencies um, handle uh, legacy modernization on their own. Uh, Commissioner, in your response to the committee's preliminary budget follow-up letter, you mentioned that do it has an attrition attrition rate of 8.3 percent. So, does the agency have trouble with retaining employees? If so, please describe the reasons. Uh, why this is the case? Actually, attrition rate of eight percent is 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 customary across the city. I mean, it's actually f fairly low, yeah. so we don't have an issue of retaining okay. people. I mean, ultimately, yeah. you want to see people move on with their career and succeed. So, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bad thing uh, having that level of attrition rate. So, I finished my questions. I yield to the chair drum. Okay, very good. We do have uh, some council members who have joined us, Council Member Cohen, Council Member Van Bramer, Council Member Joe Knight, Council Member Rosenthal, and then we have Council Member Powers and Holden who want to ask questions. But before we move on, just something that um, Chair Ku brought up, which is um, the breakage of the um, kiosk, the Link New York City kiosk. I was actually, the thing that was surprising to me was that there are cameras in there. And I didn't realize that. What, what is done with those cameras? Is that are those cameras capturing footage of anybody who passes by, or and then what is done with that with that footage? That's a great question. I'm going to ask Michael to, to elaborate on the cameras. Mm -hmm. Happy to take that, Council Member. So yeah, so the links do have cameras. Um, the purpose of the cameras are to uh, secure the kiosks themselves. Um, to, to be utilized in the event that there is vandalism or damage done to the kiosk, the cameras are there uh, to catch that. 
Um, what is done with the video data, first of all, the video data is kept encrypted by City Bridge, um, and um, what can be done with the data is strictly per, you know, prescribed by the privacy policy that uh, we have with City Bridge. Um, and what that privacy policy says is that the data is kept no more than seven days and then is completely destroyed unless there is a request in, um, related to a specific incident. Uh, I sh should also point out as it relates to the privacy policy that I've just described and the seven day deletion requirement in there, the privacy policy is part and parcel of the franchise agreement and is binding on the franchisee. Um, so uh, the video footage is there to uh, deter uh, vandalism and to catch people who vandalize the kiosks, um, but it is destroyed after seven days. And what would it take to uh, secure um, outside viewing of those, um, of the video? You would, you would need to be a law enforcement and have a legal basis to, to obtain that would, video data. Would they need a warrant? Uh, I wouldn't want to go through every single law enforcement body, but they would need to comply with legal process, which normally would probably require a subpoena or something to that effect. A subpoena, a judicial or an administrative? It, it would, it, I think it could be either. But Which one? I'm sorry? I think it could be either, but I'd have to confirm that. It's a little concerning because, um, you know, it could be anti-immigrant, used to track immigrants. And um, it's, um, it's, it's concerning to me. Um, even though there's a seven-day storage, it ends after seven days, it then it's destroyed? Correct. Okay, was, was that discussed at hearings before the implementation of Link New York City? So the implementation predates my time uh, at the agency. I, I, I can't say, council member, whether it was discussed. Okay, because I'm not sure that every New Yorker is fully aware yeah. that every time you pass one of those, you're being recorded. Understood. I mean, one thing I will say, council member, is that we as an agency and as administration um, consider privacy to be sort of a fundamental principle and something uh, that we strive to protect in every area that we work on. And for that reason, actually, the privacy policy we felt needed to be strengthened, and it was strengthened a couple years ago. Um, so we share that view. And, and I think in this instance, again, it predates my time at the agency, but it's something where you're balancing uh, a need to protect the kiosks, um, but also the privacy interests that are inherent in destroying the data. No, I hear you on that. It's just, um, it is a little concerning to me because I wasn't fully aware of that mm -hmm. and probably would like to have further discussions with you about that. I'm so happy to do so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Powers. Great, thank you. Just a quick question. In your budget, you have $38.9 million in, uh, you note that there's, I think it's state funding going to Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice for an Ecology of Justice program. Can you tell us what that program is and an update on it? Sure. Uh, John, you want to uh, provide the specifics? Uh, it covers various uh, alternatives to, the you know, uh, incarceration types of programs that Mock J is administering. We're basically just supporting them from an administrative perspective, helping them with contractual uh, services and things along those lines. So any specific questions related to any of the program itself, we could take that back to the mayor's office and get back to you with details. Okay, great. And it's state funding that's passed down to the city to cover? Correct. That? Great, thank you. Just um, one final question is, I, you know, there was a, I, a couple of conversations recently about other cities in terms of how they're, um, you know, leaning into smart cities and 5G and yeah. things like that. I, I was hoping maybe you could just give us an update in terms of where New York City is we would lean to like embracing technology like 5G. I know it's been rolling out in certain cities, um, where we are in terms of infrastructure and capacity to handle that and what hurdles might be sure. in the way of, uh, of embracing new sure. technology that consumers want. Absolutely. I mean, let me let me uh, just say a few words about five, about 5G in sure. particular. Um, I mean, first, of course, we're we're all very excited, right, about um, uh, bringing 5G right to, to New York City. Um, I'll say that it's uh, to get 5G service in the city. Obviously, we're com we're very dependent on carriers um, and their ability to deploy um, um, technology on our right of way on our poles and our rooftops uh, that enable um, uh, expanded 4G LTE service and enable 5G service. Um, so we're, uh, it is certainly a, a priority of, of ours. Um, we've had many conversations with, our carri with the carriers and our franchisees uh, about it, and um, we're gonna be starting to take steps um, forward to test it Right, and see how this all works. Um, I want to just also mention that it's 5G is is not as simple uh, a deployment uh, <laughs> as it may be ma made out to be. Right, uh, uh, it's 
uh, highly complex and requires lots of things on, on uh, uh, not just uh, um, small cell infrastructure on poles, but also phones that, that can actually um, um, uh, leverage um, the 5G service. So today, all, all phones, with exception to one, which is a Motorola, so one, one Motorola model, uh, can um, actually benefit from 5G service if it's used in a city that has it. Um, but today, outside of that, there's no iPhones, right, today that have 5G capability. Um, but again, it's absolutely something we're gonna, we're gonna be bringing to the city. First, we wanna test it, understand how it works, the operating model around it, and then we'll, we'll take so, it. And just one follow-up question, and then I'll, I know I'll see my time. Um, the, uh, where, where what, what does the timeline look like for us then in that regard, if we're sort of testing it now? And second, sure. in terms of deploying small cell technology into uh, poles sure. and things in our, in our right away, um, wh where are we in terms of permitting and allowing for that to happen. Great. Um, I'm going to ask Michael to, to elaborate. Sure. Let me sort of split it up into where we are and then where we where we'll be. Right now, we have a mobile telecom franchise that permits um, various franchisees to reserve um, street poles and install on that. And that is an ongoing pro program that we have to basically to increase 4G connectivity, um, particularly in underserved areas. Um, our new that franchise is expired, and there will be new mobile telecom franchises agreements um, put in place by the end of the year. Those franchise and agreements will have an eye on 5G. Um, one thing I did want to point out further to, to the commissioner's point, anytime 5G comes up, I think it's important to stress, we as a city are focused in addition to just the technology on equity, mm -hmm. on how, how the technology is equitable for the users. And so I think that one thing we focus on to do it is not just 5G, which is one subset of connectivity, but broadband connectivity more generally. And we're working very closely with the mayor's office of the chief technology officer on that issue, meaning connecting people in their homes and, 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 and outside, including Link NYC, which is a of connectivity. Um, so we don't take our eye, we have going to have our eye on many balls at once. You know, one of them is on broadband connectivity and making sure that it's equitable. And, and we would be very remiss if 5G ended up only in certain, in certain pockets for certain people. So I think we focus on that. Now, our prior quote unquote reservation phase for installations um, was targeted at Upper Manhattan and the outer boroughs to try to increase um, wireless installations in those areas. Um, uh, but as I said, I think as the commissioner said, we're constantly thinking about 5G, how we can be ready, but at the same time, we're thinking about broadband generally and, and what we can do to help people connect. Is, was there a timeline in there? Uh, so I think the 5G timeline is much more with the carriers than, than with municipalities. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll, you'll hear, frankly, very different answers about when 5G will be here. Um, but I think it's, it's not this calendar year before we see 5G at, at, the, at the earliest. Right. I, I would also mention that um, today uh, you may, s some New Yorkers, many people in this room, may see 5G uh, on the top right or top left of their smartphones, that isn't actually 5G um, service. Um, so I uh, just want to mention that there's some there's uh, some interesting definitions of what 5G means that are being applied by uh, certain companies. Um, by no means, right, uh, is, act is if you see 5G on your phone in New York, is, is it actually 5G service in the way that we all understand what 5G truly is? Uh, Great. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Moyer, Yeager, and Ulrich, and now we have questions from Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Commissioner, um, let's go. I, I want to pick up on. Uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Powers is 5G. Just a couple of things. I have some questions because we met with some carriers. Um, they're saying that DOT is very restrictive with their assets and not willing to work so much with them, and, and also would do it. Are you seeing? Are you are you hearing that? Or? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would disagree <laughs> with that statement. But uh, Michael, you want to elaborate? Yes, Councilmember. I think from the franchise admin administration perspective, we work very closely with our partners at DOT. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on the program itself, on the, wi on the wireless program, and, and don't have any reason to believe that. Because mm -hmm. they, 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 some want to build micro tren trenches, and, and, and they're getting some pushback. Are you hearing that? We have not, we have not heard that. We're and as I said, we, we work on a daily basis yeah. with DOT on this program, mm -hmm. um, and they, we find them to be great partners yeah. as and, we And work. utility companies are working with you. Um, uh, are they a roadblock? N no, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. No. All right. Um, 
because other cities, Houston, I guess Los Angeles, Sacramento, they have the 5G networks. Have you looked at how they um, rolled it out? <laughs> well, again, like, uh, I want to preface that um, they really don't. <laughs> I know you said they don't, they, <laughs> but, but they do. Uh, they, they say they do, you right. say they don't. Most phones don't work, but it'll catch up. I guess the phones will catch up. So, there, so I, I'll uh, provide a comment, and Michael, please chime in. But for the cities that were targeted by some of the carriers as being the first cities to have, to, um, uh, to have 5G service, the, the marketing right behind it doesn't align to the reality right of of what of of uh, 5G service delivery in those cities they're in small pockets small zones right in in a part of those cities and they require a specific phone uh, also that phone requires an additional attachment to put on top of that phone to actually receive 5G signal um, and uh, that is the truth behind 5G service that's being that's live in, in all these all these cities. Okay, but uh, future phones would have. Future phones will yeah. eventually. Yeah. So, we have, so that's how we have to look at it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and again, I, wa I want to emphasize, um, uh, re-emphasize Michael's point that we are we are working, and uh, and discussing um, our strategy for broadband holistically, which includes expansion of 4G, LTE, 5G, right? Broadband on the streets and the home, all all together with Mocto, and and what's the best way for us to do that with a specific eye on equity. Okay, I, I'm just running out of time, so I just want to get to, I want to talk about Northrop Grumman again, just yeah, a, sure. a, a, a nice win. Um, that contract was supposed to expire next month, originally. Um, when did you start the changeover um, with, the, with the private carriers, at least working on it? So the, the migration, the plan to migrate right. uh, uh, started before you before before I I, yeah. I um, was in this uh, in this role I mean, I started of course in February of 2018 so uh, the ball was already moving towards um, uh, uh, an agreement to go uh, get off of uh, Nicewin and and Northrop Grumman and move to uh, carrier carrier networks and how so, is that process done is that how many what per, how many you have 1800 uh, people working 1840 how many people are working on that changeover. Uh, I mean, we have a, 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 lar a large team together that's that's working with agencies as well, or the agencies that are using. But so it took. It's since you had to extend the contract, it t it's taking much longer than you anticipated. Is that it? It's we're trying to. We have to. We want to do this right, right. So I think there's been some time that we've spent um, negotiating um, with the carriers to ensure that when we move uh, service to their networks, that we. We get the the level of reliability, right, and performance um, uh, that that our agencies need. I think we've just been spending that extra time making sure those contracts and that agreement is rock solid. Um, because once we make the move, we're yeah. we're yeah. Because the mayor back. wanted it out um, in past January, this past January. Now he he said it was going to be gone soon, and then but you're saying something different. You're saying next no. Year. I, I'm I'm saying the exact same thing, which is we are um, we're, we're aggressively. Uh, working right now to, to get off of it. We will be off of the NISO network on the carrier networks by next year. Um, um, and in fact, by June of 20, by June of next year, we will be fully. But we heard the mayor say January of last year, he wanted the uh, January of 2019. It didn't happen. And then he said at the last press conference, I heard that he was going to go off soon, but we're saying 2020 now. So, so let me, uh, let me be more specific. So there are many agencies that currently use the NICEWA network. By January, there'll be several agencies that are already moved. Okay. Um, several. In fact, the majority of the agencies um, that use the network will actually be moved by then. Right. Um, the, the, the long poll, no pun intended perhaps here, is um, DOT um, and, the tra and moving um, traffic signal uh, uh, traffic signals to the NICEWA network, which will take a little bit longer right, than, than January, but we are absolutely right, going to have a significant number of agencies moved by, by, by then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have follow-ups uh, questions with Councilmember Moya and Joe and I. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Koo. Uh, Commissioner, thank you very much uh, for being here. Just a quick question, and uh, I don't even know if uh, this falls on you, but are you, with the program Link uh, NYC, mm. uh, you've talked about uh, sort of the uh, rollout of where they're going to be placed throughout the city, but who's in charge of the phone booths that are now decommissioned 
uh, on the public streets. Uh, Michael, sure, I'm happy to take that, Council Member. The, the franchisee that runs the link program is also in charge and responsible for the, the legacy payphones that are uh, on the streets. So, okay, because there's uh, a slew of them in, in the city that are now used as garbage receptacles. Hmm. It is, is the, who, how do you, how do we go about uh, sort of contacting them to keep the maintenance of these uh, uh, phone booths that are uh, in our districts, uh, graffiti goes up, they break the glass, mm -hmm. they stuff you know garbage in there, uh, it becomes an eyesore, uh, and by the time it gets rolled out or you find a provider that can actually go into these areas, how do we fix that problem? Sure, two, two points. Number one, council member, if you have, if any of the committee has an issue with any particular payphone, you should bring it directly to me or to okay. my team, and we can engage directly with the franchisee to see what's going on with that particular payphone. I think the second thing I will say is that we are looking at the payphone portfolio, um, and if there's a particular problem payphone where we don't see a link coming right away into that, you know, maybe we can look into that question as well. But as a starting point, we're the franchise administrators. The franchisee is obligated to keep the phones in good repair. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's any particular issue, I would also add if there's an issue of, um, uh, uh, um, uh, is there some type of nuisance around, right, then we can engage with potentially the police department or whomever. Mm -hmm. But as a starting point, you can come right to us. It's our responsibility to work with the franchisee to make sure that the payphones are, are in good shape. Great, and, and, and just, because it's great that I know you, Michael, and I can call you, and, and but if the public hmm. wants to, is it, 311, how, yes. does, that, how 311. does that work? Yes, yeah. 311, three, well the public can, public can and does call us frequently actually, but yes, 311 would be the way to go. You call 311, you tell 311, this is where there's a problem at this payphone and that would be directed to the right people. Right. Great, um, offline I'll get you some, some locations. Where to find us. <laughs> thank, thank you, Michael, thank you, Commissioner, thank you. Right. You, could, you uh, can call me, call me as well. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member Joni. Thank you, Chair. I just want to piggyback uh, on a question that the chair brought up uh, with regard to the kiosks, are those cameras using facial recognition software? They are not. Is there any intent in the future to have facial Absolutely recognition? Absolutely not. In fact, facial recognition is ex is uh, effectively banned, right? Under the privacy uh, policy. Under the current privacy policy that we have in place. Good. Uh, your involvement, to what degree, with August cameras? Is it your software? Um, uh, the, the police uh, cameras that are used to monitor traffic and whatnot that are placed in locations throughout the city? I, I, that is not our, yeah. that's not our technology. Yeah, that's an, that would be NY, NYPD. Right? So you have nothing Hopefully, to do Holy manages that network, that camera network. I see you have a lease adjustment um, for fiscal 2020. Uh, through, 2020, through 2023 for $1.1 million. How much property do you actually have that is city owned and how much do you have that is leased from a third party? Got it. Uh, John, can you take that? Uh, the, we only have one city owned, pro we have space in one city owned property and that is at the municipal building. Everything else is privately owned and there's probably about another half dozen sites or more half dozen sites that are leased? That are leased. You have the Metrotech sites, you have 255 Greenwich, you have 59 Maiden Lane, so that's already five right there. And there's one up on Broadway as well, so it's six, six private, one uh, public. How, how many total square footage are we referring to? Uh, I would have to get back to you with the square footage. When was the last time we've gone through a vacancy uh, on the leased properties? Uh, do we have any square footage that is not being utilized? Are we uh, no. overleasing properties? No, actually with the <laughs> amount of vacancies that we have, we are actually challenged for space. Yeah, we're full. You're full. <laughs> there's, there's very little space uh, that we have. So long term, you're gonna be looking for additional space? Potentially. Um, I hope that'll be a city owned well, property. Well, that's why I said potentially in terms of in terms of additional cost, if we can find some city-owned space, then obviously there would be no additional cost. The reason I bring this up, uh, and I'm finding this out from agency to departments, on city-owned property, we have tremendous amount, when I say tremendous, one square foot of unutilized space 
while we're leasing additional space from private third-party landlords is a problem for me. We're not, you, we're not spending taxpayer dollars wisely. And I'm going to be hopefully working with you on your needs in the future to make sure that we find space within our own city-owned properties versus third-party landlords uh, when we have the space. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll set an example on mm. how to best utilize the properties that we own. Obviously, the, the best people to engage that conversation would, would be DCAS, DCAS since they manage the right. Yeah, I don't think DCAS has gone through it with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, and the definition of vacant space uh, I think is loosely defined. Thank you. So much to your 5G proposal. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. This is the end of this portion of the hearing. We appreciate you coming in, Commissioner, you and your team, and uh, we'll be talking to you. Great, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. We're gonna take a five minute break, and then we will start with the fire department.
Good afternoon, everyone. If you are here from the previous portion of the hearing, we ask you to please make your way out of the chambers so we can begin our next portion, fire and emergency management. Once again, if you could please exit the chambers if you are not here for fire and emergency management. If everyone could please find their seats, thank you. Please find seats, we're gonna begin. Okay, uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, chaired by Councilmember Joe Borelli. Um, I don't see any of our other colleagues, but we just heard from the Do It, from Do It, and we will now hear from Daniel Nigro, the Commissioner of the Fire Department. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember and Chair Joe Borelli. Good afternoon, my name is Joseph Borelli and I'm the chair of the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. I'm pleased to be joined by Finance Committee Chair Drum and my colleagues today. Uh, today's fiscal year 2020 executive budget hearing to review the Fire Department's budget. Uh, the committee will review the Fire Department's proposed budget for fiscal 2020, its 2019 to 2023 capital commitment plan and its 10 year capital strategy. It is important to note that both the expense and capital plans do not include any of the new needs called for by the council. On April 9th, we released our fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget response, which presents a unified vision for the, of the council for increased accountability in the budget process, while at the same time shoring up the city's social safety net to protect our fellow residents in their times of need, uh, and providing resources that access opportunities for upward economic mobility. In response, we specifically called for the department to create a firehouse in the Hudson Yards, as well as building a new EMS station on Staten Island. Additionally, uh, we called for an increased pay rates for EMS staff, as well as the addition of staff for the, uh, the addition of staff to existing four firefighter companies. These are the needs that the community has been pushing for that are key to the success successful development of public safety across the city. I'm disappointed to see that despite the great need, the executive budget does not include funding to address such issues. Uh, the committee would like to know what the department plans to do to address these deficiencies as well as an update on the department's recruitment plan uh, and all the new needs that were added in FY 2020. I also want to make sure we thank our committee staff for their hard work, uh, Anne Maria Camello, Camello Vega, excuse me, uh, Isha Wright, uh, Josh Kingsley, Will Hongach, and my chief of staff, Frank Mascia. I'd like to welcome you, Commissioner Nigro, and, and all your folks. And I, I want to—I just want to point out, not that you get distracted, but we do have a slideshow this year. So just prepare to be wowed. Prepare I, to be wowed. I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask Council to square the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay. Hey, thank you, and Commissioner. You can start. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and Co-Chair Borelli and all council members present. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the executive budget for fiscal year 2020 for the fire department. I'm joined this afternoon by First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Chief of Department John Sudnick, Chief of EMS Lillian Bonsignor, and Assistant Commissioner for Budget and Finance Stephen Rush. 
First, I'd like to recognize the terrible tragedy that befell our city last week when a fire in Harlem caused the death of six family members, including four children. The fire was caused by unattended cooking. Unfortunately, there was no working smoke alarm present in the apartment where the fire occurred. The next day, we had another fatal fire in Manhattan where, again, there was no working smoke alarm. We have for several years now worked aggressively to spread the word about the importance of having working smoke alarms in one's home or apartment. In November 2015, we launched a campaign called Get Alarmed NYC that committed to distributing and installing 100,000 smoke alarms throughout the city. Thanks to help from the City Council and City Hall, along with other partners, this initiative has so far resulted in more than 200,000 smoke and combination smoke CO alarms being distributed to New Yorkers, many of which were installed in homes by Red Cross volunteers. The latest shipment of alarms, more than 60,000, have just been delivered to the department, and we will continue to distribute them and install them in homes in areas of the city where incidences of fires and fire deaths continue to occur. We will be contacting elected officials, community stakeholders, clergy leaders, and partner organizations to coordinate distribution events. I look forward to working with the council members here today and with your colleagues to get these alarms to the people who need them. One other update I'd like to share with you is a recent change in senior leadership at the department. Following the retirement of Chief, Chief James Booth, Last week, I appointed Lillian Bonsignor to the position of Chief of EMS. Chief Bonsignor, who has 28 years of service with FDNY, is the first woman in the history of the department to serve as the highest ranking officer in EMS. She is also the first open member of the LGBT community to hold the post. Along with Chief Bonsignor's appointment, Alvin Suriel has been promoted to Assistant Chief of EMS, the second highest uniformed rank. Chief Suriel, who has 30 years of service, is the first Hispanic member appointed to the role. In addition to the distinguished work that they will do on behalf of the people of New York, I am proud that Chief Bonsignor and Chief Suriel will also serve as examples of diverse leadership as we continue our mission to build a fire department that reflects the diversity of the city we protect. I'm happy to report that the mayor's executive budget for fiscal year 2020 funds the fire department at levels that will enable us to effectively protect life and property, improve the services that we provide, and expand our efforts to educate the public. The budget provides $43 million over two fiscal years to fund an expansion of the fly car pilot program. Under this system, we send an advanced life support, ALS fly car, which provides paramedic level care, and a basic life support, BLS ambulance, which provides EMT level care to each potentially life-threatening emergency. Whichever unit responds first is able to immediately begin providing care. The ALS unit provides an advanced life support level assessment and the BLS unit transports the patient to the hospital. The ALS unit only accompanies the patient to the hospital if the patient needs ALS level care, which happens on less than half of all responses. This frees up the ALS crew faster, allowing them to respond to the next call and streamlining our ability to get the appropriate level of care to each patient. Beginning in October 2019, the fly car program will be extended to cover the entire borough of the Bronx. With this additional funding, we'll transition the rest of our ALS ambulances in the Bronx to fly cars. As we begin the expansion of the program this fall, we will add 17 additional fly cars, resulting in a total of 27 fly cars across the borough during our busiest hours. Other EMS funding in the executive budget includes $2.6 million to enable the department to take over, six ambulance, take over six ambulance tours that were previously run by Montefiore Medical Center. This includes funding 28 positions, and it will increase the percentage of tours in the 911 system 
that are operated by municipal units to 67%. The budget also funds 16 new positions in emergency medical dispatch. These positions will be used to support the creation of a quality assurance team and to maintain span of control within emergency dispatch. Another commitment in this budget is $2.6 million in fiscal year 2020 for improvements at the EMS Academy at Fort Totten, in addition to $8 million in capital funds in fiscal year 2020 and $50 million in capital funds in fiscal year 2021. This will fund fiscal improvements and allow the department to hire additional instructors, which will enable the department to increase class size so that we can train more EMTs and paramedics. Another major commitment in the executive budget is $3.2 million in fiscal year 2020 for technology pro projects. I am pleased to provide the council with a few updates on education and outreach matters that we've previously discussed here. The department is working with the Administration of Children's Services and American Red Cross to train approximately 3,000 frontline child welfare staff throughout 2019. ACS workers learn how to examine homes for potential fire hazards and refer families to the Red Cross for smoke alarm installations. As of the end of April, over 400 workers have been trained. We have also continued our partnership with the Department of Youth and Community Development. On April 24th, our two agencies carried out the second annual Youth Firehouse Initiative. More than 2,400 kindergarten through fifth grade students from the DYCD Compass after school program visited more than 50 firehouses, meeting with members of the department and receiving fire safety education instruction. We are also looking forward to another round of our very popular citywide open houses in the fall. I thank the council for your partnership and ongoing support as we carry out the mission of protecting the lives and property of the people of New York. And I'd be glad to take your questions at this time. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Cabrera and Councilmember Maisel. And let me also start off by thanking you for appointing Chief Bonsignor and also Chief Soriel. Um, it's great that you have done that. and. Um, you know, that diversity really reflects New York City. And as an openly uh, gay man myself, I'm really proud to see Chief Bonsignor here also. So congratulations and, and thank you very much. Um, as part of the uh, PEG program, the FDNY had an initial PEG target of 6.5 million. The FDNY exceeded the target and the fiscal 2020 executive plan introduces a total savings of 10.5 million. Part of the savings includes implementing a hiring freeze of 54 positions in fiscal 2019 and in the out years. Can you identify where these positions will come from and how the hiring freeze will impact the department's operations? Uh, I'll let someone else give you details. I do know that it does not affect the, our members who respond and carry out the primary mission of the department, that's uh, firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics. Council member, we're working on some of the details on where the units that will be cut. We're still working with OMB on this. I will tell you that areas like fire prevention, which is inspection-based and revenue-based, is exempt. Obviously, EMS is exempt. Um, we're hoping there will be some other exemptions. But those details aren't worked out as of yet. But we do have a significant number of vacancies in the department across all units. And some of those will have to be, obviously, 54 of those will have to be eliminated. Okay. And, um, you know, I've been asking every um, department that comes in, if we can get that within the next couple of weeks, um, it'd be very useful to us in our negotiations. Yeah, we're supposed to provide OMB by June 30th where the reductions will come from. Okay, thank you. Um, um, in fiscal 19, savings included 7.2 million, and in fiscal 2020, expected savings total only 3.3 million, with the difference attributable to the fact that the $7 million in fringe savings will be implemented only in fiscal 2019. Why is there no uh, fringe savings anticipated for 2020? Potentially, there may be. This is federally funded money that is in our budget. 
for fringe cost, which would be obviously transferred out of our budget. Potentially in FY20, there could be. It's not, we have not come to that yet. And would that come with the reduction in a head count? The head count would be in addition to that. In, in addition. Uh, can you go over the department strategy for regarding, regarding the hiring freeze and um, how did you decide which vacant positions would be eliminated? We have not as yet decided which positions. Right. We are trying to take them in the areas that have the least impact on, on service delivery and mostly in administrative areas. So did OMB just give you a number? O OMB looked at our vacancies across the board and some of the vacancies are longstanding and therefore they made this reduction target across all agencies. I don't know the details of how they arrived at it. Okay, because you know, when we look at just the vacancies and we cut them, the question always remains, is it a true reduction or, or is it really just a savings in terms of the headcount? No, it will be a, a, a reduction in full-time headcount in the budget, yes. Okay. Um, over the, let's talk a little bit about overtime. Over the past five years, the department budgeted overtime cost at $240.5 million. During the same time, FDNY's actual overtime cost averaged $277.7 million. This means there's an average difference between the budgeted and actual of $37.2 million or 13% in overtime expenditures. Why does the uh, FDNY exceed its overtime budget? And given that it does, why doesn't your fiscal 2020 overtime budget more realistically align to the actual spending? That's a great question. Um, we traditionally um, have overtime issues in the fire department. Um, we do our best to meet the targets that are, are set by OMB. We agree that it is a challenging target, but we are expecting with additional firefighter hires, and hopefully a reduction in medical leave, which impacts our ability to staff fire companies, that we should see an improvement in overtime, along with reductions in our light duty staff. So do you have any new measures that you might take to control the overtime budget? Um, right now, there are several we're looking at on, on, in terms of medical leave controls, and as well as reducing the light duty population. Uh, basically, members who are long-term would be retired, um, and to the pension rolls, and that would decrease the number of light duty people, and then we could increase more full duty people, and therefore that should reduce the overtime. And uh, also, when we, it, it took us, and we're still now not even up to headcount, but we're very, very close, because of a hiring freeze that, that lasted for a number of years in the fire department, we fell very far behind in our firefighter staffing. And uh, although we've hired many people over the last four years, we're just now reaching the numbers that should have some impact on, on the overtime. Previously, um, we needed considerable overtime just to staff our, our units. Are you exempt from the uh, current uh, hiring freeze or, or not? We are in the uni on the uniform side, firefighters, EMS, paramedics, but not on the civilian side. So do you think that the department um, will be uh, affected by the freeze um, in, the, in the civilian side? Well, I think, I think anyone would say when there is a, a, a limit on the people, the jobs we can fill, there may be some impact on it administratively, but certainly not on our ability to serve the public. As do the uh, civilians get overtime, Commissioner? Some of our civilians do get overtime. Is that a large enough number to affect or help with the overtime cost that it would see enough of a reduction there? Much of the overtime comes in areas such as mechanics and, and trades personnel that take care of the firehouses. Um, and in those areas, we're going to try to, to the best possible uh, reduce um, um, their, their cost on overtime, but um, overall, the overtime needs there will remain. So most of the overtime is with the uniformed? The personnel? uniformed is, the, the, is over, you know, most of the overtime in the fire department. Approximately this year, we'll spend about $241 million in tax levy. On EMS, we'll spend another $51 million, civilian another $21 million. Okay, I don't know if we have a graphic, but we may. Um, a 10-year capital strategy. 
as outlined in the capitals and the council's uh, as outlined in the capitals preliminary budget response the fiscal 20 to 29 preliminary 10-year capital strategy presented by the administration was not true to its name and many of the 10-year strategy categories have a dramatic decline in planned spending or close to no spending in the second half of the strategy the executive 10-year capital strategy still fall, fails to address planning in the <laughs> excuse me, in the out years for many city agencies, including FDNY. <laughs> this has been true for education as well. Uh, did FDNY work with OMB and DCP to develop the agency's 10-year capital strategy? And what uh, did that back and forth look like? So on, on the capital strategy, on the long-term capital plan, historically, you'll see that most of the funding is front-loaded in the four-year plan, and then it decreases. But as you move forward into the, in the out years, as you get closer to the out years, the numbers are, again, negotiated with OMB, and they tend to, they obviously do grow higher. Part of the issues with the capital plan is, and it's pointed out by OMB, and correctly so, and not just in our agency, but many agencies, there is a challenge in spending the commi uh, committing to the dollars in a timely fashion, and as a result, lots of times, the funds roll over from year to year. So we, while we do our best, um, there is a delay sometimes on procuring things. But things like the, the facilities and fleet to the more critical areas in the department are usually funded fairly well by OMB. And you, so you believe that this plan is sufficient? Obviously, the out-year plan obviously is dropping a lot, but we're not really concerned with the out-years beyond the first two or three years of the capital plan. Okay. Um, can you provide your retention rates broken down by demographics. Uh, a retention rate of our members? Yes. Well, I believe, as close as I can, I can calculate, I think we lose about 4% on fire and um, about 9% in EMS. Okay. Um, during the preliminary budget hearing, you testified that the uh, most recent class to graduate from the uh, Firefighter Academy included 15 female graduates. What are your projections for the next class? Well, we just, uh, a class just went into our Fire Academy, and that class has uh, 17 uh, females. And um, last year when we spoke, um, I asked you a little bit about um, LGBTQ employees. How many of the department staff is LGBTQ? I don't believe we track that. I thought that you said that in some ways you do. And I was surprised to hear that actually. We don't track it. We do try to support those employees and we try to recruit during the recruitment campaign. Um, and so we have a liaison uh, and we have a number of staff and we have a fraternal organization and we try to make sure that those resources are shared with the firefighters, but we don't track them in such a way that we could tell you uh, what the numbers were. So is the support program Fire Flag? Yeah, yep. It is, and yeah. do you know how many people are in there, or how many? I don't, I don't believe they would tell us. Chief, would you know? I don't, no, I'm sorry. Are you a member? No. Oh, we gotta get I, you in there. <laughs> I can say I've been to their meetings, there's a few dozen people at those meetings, but I don't believe they track everyone as well for privacy. I ask this, you know, because um, even, and I'm, I, I have a piece of legislation, that would require all city agencies to voluntarily ask people that in uh, initial stages of employment, you know, so that we can get a better feel of how many LGBT people there are. So that's where I'm coming from on this. I think it also sends a message that the department is open to it or whatever. So that's why I'm asking these questions. Yeah, one thing we do do for recruits is we let them know that there's uh, an LGBTQ uh, advocate and we email them about that so that they can reach out proactively if they'd like to. And to be honest with you, I do see them at LGBT events and mm -hmm. things like that as well. Yeah. It's very positive. Um, now, is the department meeting its goal of diversifying uniform and EMS staff? I think we, uh, our recruitment campaign for the exam, we actually exceeded the goal. And, um, and right what was now, that goal, Commissioner? Um, you have the, the numbers for our... We had a goal to recruit a list that represented the same demographics as the city, and we did that. We actually exceeded it by a few percentage points. By what? We exceeded it by a few ex percentage points in each demographic. 
Yeah, okay. and Do you know the, the numbers there, or? I can send them to you. Okay, that would be great. So on the, on the firefighting f force, right now in the department, and it's you know, at, a, at a high point in the history of the department, more than 30% of the members of the department are non-white males. Mm -hmm. And that number continues to grow with each probationary firefighter class. And the department has, over the past four years, become um, more and more diverse. Okay. Um, do you have a list of uniform and EMS staff who are bilingual? We, in some cases, do know that. Um, we do a series of trainings, things like fire safety education, and when we do those trainings, we do ask and actually recruit for members who are bilingual. So we don't know every bilingual member, but we know many of them. So do you know, like, when you respond to a fire or to some type of a medical call, that there is always um, somebody bilingual or... Um, speaking another language other than English? Not always, no. What, do, what, do, what would staff do? What would um, officers do or, or EMS officers do in the case of um, a non-English speaking person? Well, I think Is there a phone? can discuss that with the, on the EMS side. We have, a, we have a very diverse EMS crowd and it's not difficult for us to find someone to translate, but we do also have translation services. And how do you get a hold of those translation services? It's through, by phone, through a phone call. By phone? Yes. Is that true for the fire department? Well, on the medical calls, we work with the EMS and, and we use the same. But I mean like for a fire call? Negative. No. Okay. Because we did have a very big fire in Elmhurst about two years ago. And that was a bit of an issue. People didn't know my Spanish is okay. I can get by, but um, telling people what was happening, where they were, you know, was, where they were supposed to go, et cetera. I think having had uh, somebody who could speak Spanish or get some type of translation would have been helpful. I think on the initial stages of a fire, it has, it has not been the, uh, a critical issue, but we do bring people in as a follow-up. When people need services between all of the agencies of the city that are there uh, following a, f a fire, all of those services can be provided. Well, I think, I think it would be good to look at um, as a, a possibility of, of also equipping your uniformed uh, officers with some type of ability to get uh, translation services. Yes, we no? Do that. We do, um, they do have devices that do, in some cases, have translation services on them. I don't know that they always are able to I use mean, I, the The police department's moving in that direction. Yeah, we, we are as well. Okay, so hopefully next year we'll have more information on that. Okay. What's that? Yeah, we can, we'll okay. look into it. All right. Um, in the past, the department has partnered with DIFTA to provide fire safety workshops in senior centers across the city. Can you give us an update on that? Um, and... Um, how many workshops you've done, et cetera? As far as uh, breaking it down, I, I think we can, we don't have that right now, but we can get it. Um, the number of total visits we've had, I think uh, somewhere I may have that, fire safety education visits. Anyone? 6,000, there is more than 6,000 in, in a year. And that covers whether it's senior centers, whether it's community groups, schools, et cetera. Okay. Um, let, me, let, me, let me go on. Uh, in the past, the department, um, excuse me, during the preliminary budget hearing, you testified that one of the department's greatest challenges has been antiquated regulations that classify EMS as a transportation service for the purposes of Medicaid reimbursement. Please provide an update on the department's strategy to address this challenge. Well, I know we, um, we do have a strategy for increasing our revenue. That would increase it by approximately $22 million. But uh, has that been initiated yet, Steve? Yes. Um, so working in concert with our billing vendor, OMB, Health and Hospitals, uh, we have developed a methodology which will get a percent to New York State. 
on increasing Medicaid revenues, which we think would enhance the budget by $22 million. $22 million. Okay. Thank you. Can you provide an update on DDC's design and construction of EMS Station 17 in the Bronx? Well, we have th currently we have three projects that are um, in various stages. Rescue, Rescue 2 in Brooklyn, which we, uh, which we believe will be opened in November. Station 17 in the Bronx, which is underway. And um, in the planning, st pol very preliminary stage is a new firehouse in Rockaway on 116th Street. Um, I would say the Station 17 in the Bronx is at the midpoint of those three projects for, for our department right now. Okay, thank you. How much of FDNY's operations and maintenance work is contracted out? We spend a significant amount of money on contracting services. Um, it might be in plumbing, it might be sewer work, electrical. We do have a, a robust staff as well and, and a good capital program, but some of the services we don't have the expertise on, overhead doors, repairing those kind of things, those expertises do not lie in the firehouses, so we rely on outside vendors. Can you provide us, a, you know, after the hearing, with a list of those people that uh, you contract with? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Commissioner, you mentioned that the bulk of overtime comes from uniform uh, services. However, the civilian overtime spending is $18.5 million higher uh, than the $41.6 million budgeted at adoption. So what is the department doing to right-size the civilian overtime budget? When we're looking at civilian, sometimes we get they're grouped in together. It might be EMS it might be in there as well. But I will tell you, on EMS, we have significant staffing issues because of a loss of personnel. And we are, we're tr one of the plans that we have in the long term, starting in FY20, would be Fort Totten would be expanded so more classroom space would be made available so classes can grow um, from the current 180 on EMTs to 225. Same thing with paramedic staffing, it can grow from 70 to 90. So these kind of things will help us catch up and reduce our overtime in the out years. Okay, and then the, um, the um, EMS recruiting problem, what, what, is, what, what causes that? I, I don't believe we have a recruiting problem. I think we have, we have an issue with being able to uh, educate students faster. We can only put 180 people in the class I maximum. See. So by our increased uh, capacity at Fort Totten, we'll be able to increase those classes to 240. Mm -hmm. And then you have a retention problem, though, with, with the new, with, with well, the what, We lose EMTs to fire because mm -hmm. there's an exam, a promotion exam from EMT or paramedic to firefighter and people avail themselves of that, and we have lost personnel. So have you asked for um, larger space for EMT training? We have, and we've, got, we've received funding for it. Okay, all right. Thank you, I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Borelli. Thank you, and I'd like to recognize Council Member Adams is here. Good to see you. Um, According to the department, the uh, average EMS response times fluctuate between 4 minutes 27 seconds to 5.45, depending on the type of incident. Uh, however, response time in the Bronx uh, averaged 7.52. Why is that high or higher than the other boroughs? And uh, why, even with the fly cars, is it only down to 6.43 and not within a normal range? Well, the reason we started, initiated the pilot for fly cars in the Bronx was because of the highest, it has the highest per capita demand for our services of any of the boroughs. Um, so while we've had some impact, we're still in the process of bringing it down, and that's the main reason why we're very happy to have gotten funding to increase the fly car program in the Bronx to address this. Um, but, but is there something preventing the fly car from, from lowering the time even further? Or is there enough of them? Should there be more of them, I guess is what I'm getting at? Well, we need increases in staffing, which we are gradually building up. 
and we do believe the additional fly car and BLS ambulances that go along with the fly car program will put the Bronx in line with the rest of the city. Can, can you explain how we staff the fly car and then where we find those technicians from, the paramedics, and then how we backfill them? Well, the current fly cars are staffed with one paramedic lieutenant and a, and a paramedic. Um, moving forward, they will be staffed with two paramedics. We continue to educate classes of, and graduate classes of paramedics, and uh, that's how we staff them. So c could you just go into more detail then on the, the 15 million to e enhance the program in the Bronx? Well, it's actually it's uh, over two years, 43 million. It will provide the additional staffing for these units and for the BLS units that are part of it, because for each fly car, there's a, uh, an additional BLS ambulance that becomes the transport vehicle. Okay. And those are staffed by EMTs. Um, you might remember there was some discussion of the fifth firefighter uh, over the past few weeks. Can you just describe what the criteria is for choosing the 20 companies that have the fifth firefighter? Sure. 20 engine companies? Uh, John, you might want to do that. Uh, we have a discussion. Uh, as you know, we've increased them incrementally over the last four years, uh, five a year. And uh, we get input from the Bureau of Operations. Uh, they have discussions with uh, the borough commanders. Uh, we look primarily at activity. Uh, we look at uh, response areas, uh, structural fires, a number of responses, and uh, that's how we uh, determine the criteria. But on average, you would say that a, a busier engine company would be more likely to have a fifth firefighter? Generally. So if all the engine companies were responding to 600,000 more runs, isn't it better that all the companies have a fifth firefighter? Well, I think the criteria is not solely the number of responses they have. It can be um, units that frequently operate alone, units that may be more remote, um, five firefighter units. No one would dispute that five firefighter units um, may be superior to four firefighter units in some ways, but the department has a long history of being successful at fighting fires with four firefighter units, which is, you know, more staffing than any really anywhere else in the country. Does the department have a cost estimate of, of the cost of adding another, I guess, 170? Well, I think each, each 20 uh, units would cost us about $800,000 a month. If we made all of our units, uh, five firefighters would be about $100 million. Actually, the number would be closer to $200 million because you'd have to add approximately 900 firefighters. Um, is, is there any discussion of eliminating uh, the fifth firefighter from the current 20? Well, the, the trigger, the number that triggers that is a medical leave number that's already been exceeded, but the department has not reduced uh, the staffing, and we are looking at how that number is, is measured. So there is no immediate um, plan to reduce in those companies. W would you characterize it as somewhat unproductive that we go through this process every six or seven months, depending on, uh, on different incidents of um, weighing whether to eliminate the fifth firefighter? I think the, you know, the, the trigger is the trigger. The process of weighing uh, whether to do it or not is, is something new. Um, I think medical leave being tied to the f to staffing is is unusual, but this was what was negotiated between the union and the city many years ago, uh, and was acceptable to both sides. So until some other formula can be successfully negotiated, this is what we have. I, I certainly agree that it, it, it takes uh, two to tango, um, but is it is it a good policy or bad policy to? Um, to eliminate or to change something that affects public safety rather than a perk uh, with respect to medical leave? 
we're not we're not cutting the ice cream from the, from well, the kitchen. Being that the fire, that the department operates with the majority of four firefighter engine companies, we don't believe that a four firefighter engine company makes people unsafe in the areas served by them. So I don't see this the correlate direct correlation between public safety and the number of firefighters on the engine. Um, can you just discuss the, uh, you mentioned uh, a $2 million number with uh, respect to the academy, but the, the capital plan calls for $58.3 million. Um, and if I read correctly, it's supposed to be spent in fiscal year 2020. Can you tell us where you are on the capital side of Fort Totten and whether there's a design done or, or not? There's two stages. Um, there's $8 million actually in FY20, an additional $50 million in FY21. And this is the first that we hope will be several stages <coughs> to renovate uh, Fort Totten, which is long, in our, in our view, long-term overdue. Um, this stage is basically addressing all of the infrastructure needs, utilities and things of that nature. So we expect that by we will have the designing ready, design ready in FY20 and move into construction and, yeah, and work in FY20, FY21. Um, go, going back to something that, that Council Member Drum uh, talked about, the retention rate with uh, EMS. Um, has the department ever evaluated what the cost would be? Uh, and I fully am aware that this is subject to collective bargaining, but has the department ever calculated what the cost would be uh, to, to give EMS uh, technicians and EMTs pay raises uh, over a period of time or significant pay raises that will put them perhaps in better parity with uh, other departments, other large city departments? No, we've not. Is that something that, you, that the department would do in this next fiscal year? I, I don't... Uh the department will look at the next, you know, the, the current promotion exam list is uh, virtually exhausted. So for the next few years, there will not be a outflow of EMTs from f into firehouses. Uh, so prior to the next exam being given, we'll take a look at what the criteria will be. Uh, as far as uh, salary ranges for, for those people, um, we have not looked at the numbers, you know, what, what would it take to keep people in EMS rather than have them take a promotion exam to fire or keep them as EMTs rather than move up to paramedics? Um, no, we have not. Do, do we know the PS and OTPS cost of uh, training new EMTs? I'm sure we do. Yes, we can get you those numbers. Um, for we approximately train 180 EMTs at a time. Within that, there is, and Chief Bonsignor could speak to it as well, there is a lot of instructional staff over at the academy that goes into that. Um, so we can give you a per capita cost for each EMT student and for paramedics as well. So I'm, glad, I'm glad we're expanding the, the academy, um, but is there some sort of cost benefit to, to paying EMTs more so that they're less likely to leave, well, that we may not have to train as many? There's also a benefit to the EMT themselves that they have a path they, either to paramedic or fire uh, if they so choose, and also for the department that new firefighters have had training because so many of their calls will be medical calls, had prior training in EMS and worked in our EMS system. Uh, we found that those classes uh, are more diverse and for those reasons, it's also a benefit to the department that people do promote from EMT to firefighter. What is the cost to be trained as a paramedic? It's a nine month program. So it's extensive amount of time where we take them out of, of the field and we put them in classes for nine months. So it's, an, it's, an, it's actually an overtime cost to us in addition to the instructor cost at the academy. Um, just going to the revenue side of EMS, uh, since you guys are working with H&H uh, and, &H and OMB to develop uh, a reimbursement strategy, can you sort of go into a bit more details and 
Uh, do you anticipate EMS revenue to grow uh, in the out years? Uh, we believe uh, this methodology will be sustainable in the out years. It is based on a something that's been identified that's going on in other states across the country. Legislatively, it would require um, just the New York State Department of Health to work with us and then approach um, CMS to make this um, a proposal on um, getting additional for Medicaid costs, additional reimbursement to basically m more fully cover the cost of a Medicaid transport. Right now we get reimb reimbursed about $200 for any uh, Medicaid transport. Our billing rate, which is, reflects our actual cost, is probably about $800. When you, you say this is something that other departments are looking into, uh, have any done this successfully? This has been done in other states already, yes. Um, is there a need for a new EMS station on Staten Island? Well, Staten Island's a large borough geographically. It does at the present time have the best response time of any of the boroughs. We've evaluated it. It's not at the top of our list, but maybe at some point it will. Um, but right now, we don't see an immediate need. Um, have you, this is something I asked uh, at a hearing uh, maybe two or three hearings ago. Does the department calculate the number of tours run privately? Uh, I'm sure it calculates those operated by the city. Does it calculate the number of tours run privately? And I believe by privately we mean either directly by a, a hospital or uh, by a, another an ambulance company working for a hospital. It's approximately one third of the system. Um, do we have any reason to believe that more hospital systems and private providers will uh, forego their service for lack of profit in the future? We don't believe, we have not heard that and we don't believe so. After a, a number of years of reductions from the voluntary sector, it's, it's, it's more stabilized. Uh, so we don't have any signs that that's occurring. And what is the, uh, almost anecdotally, what is the normal length of time between when you hear informally that a, a hospital may discontinue its service to when there's some official notice and then to when it actually gets Taking they're under they're under a, an agreement with us. I won't say a contract, but there's an agreement, and they have to give us. I believe there's a termination clause in the contract that allows them to exit. Um, so I don't know the exact terms, but we can provide that those agreement uh, an example of an agreement to you. Um, the wireless uh, emergency response network. Uh, the FY 2020 budget includes 3.2 million uh, and more in the out years to replace the emergency response network. Um, do, do you anticipate the amount that has already been allocated uh, and projected to be allocated enough, or will there be more costs for this? There's funding in both the expense budget for the capitally ineligible and, uh, and obviously operating budget costs, but a lot of the funding is also in the capital budget. And that, and that goes through, um, uh, actually through do it. You know, there's a central budget for what they call uh, dispatch type services for multiple agencies. Um, how involved is the department in the next gen 911 system planning? Very. Is it concerning that one of the potential bidders may not be meeting all the requirements of the bid? We'd have to get back to you on that. Um, going to uh, fire alarms, I see you guys have allocated one million. Oh, you, actually, Commissioner, you mentioned one million um, for the uh, the Get Alarm program. Is that program going to be continued in the following year? And if so, uh, at how much? Well, we say we just received uh, sixty thousand smoke alarms. That will be going out soon, some of which will be installed by Red Cross, and we hope to continue this program going forward. Is there a public benefit to having uh, uh, fire alarms hardwired in, uh, say, NYCHA buildings, in residential units, so that potentially a, a resident can't disable it? Hardwired uh, smoke alarms are 
generally more dependable than battery-operated smoke alarms for that very reason. If the council were to propose legislation uh, to require at least one uh, in uh, each unit, uh, would that be something the department supported? Supposing um, money was no factor. Assuming money was no factor, which is always a good, uh, we would say hard wire smoke alarms would be more attractive. Okay. Um, and, the, and the final question I have is on the strategic plan. The, the last uh, strategic plan publicly available from the department goes from 2015 to 2017. Uh, why, why is that and is there, any, uh, is there any anticipation of publishing an updated strategic plan? Um, one is not close to being published, no. Is there a need for a, strate a public strategic plan for the department? I don't think there's a, a, a need for one. I think the, the plan was more for a target for ourselves. I think it's, it's more for the department internally. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Council Member Joni, I know you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on choosing two incredible Bronx sites to be the chief of EMS and the assistant chief of EMS. Thank you for that. And I want to thank every man and woman that puts on that uniform that, in da that dangers themselves for the safety of others. I'm forever grateful to you. I am concerned about those numbers. And if you can bring them up again, uh, the Bronx response rates. And based on my quick calculations, how can we have such a difference in response times? Almost 75% when we compare a response time of four minutes and 27 seconds to as high as seven minutes and 52 seconds for the borough of the Bronx. I'm not sure what numbers we're looking at right now. I'm looking at something that is it a, a response to fires, response to medical calls? Average EMS response times Average. fluctuating between four minutes and 27 seconds to five minutes and 45 seconds, depending on the type of the incident. Yet for 2019, we're looking at a response time, and the red is the ALS assigned incidents versus the fly car, which is marked in green. But my question is, first of all, for the borough of the Bronx, how could there be as high as 75% difference in response times? What would be the cause? I, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to see that it is 75%. I don't see that number. I anymore. did my math. It's a 75% difference somewhere, but uh, it's certainly not reflected there or in the material I have, so I think we're looking at two different things. Well, I, I would say that a response time of four minutes and 27 seconds is the low that I'm looking at, the numbers that were provided to me. And to a high of 752, and the difference is nearly 75 percent. I don't. Uh, let me, I let me let's go backwards, Commissioner. I, I will. 427. It, of the five boroughs, which is the borough? You're looking, you're looking at structural fires right now. 427 is the citywide average in, in 2018. What would it be for the Bronx? To structural fires. And for the borough of the Bronx? Citywide. The borough of the Bronx was 434. Um, that, you know, I don't see it anywhere. I don't see that number anywhere else in my numbers. This is EMS response times. You know what, let me, let me rephrase this whole question. Okay. Commissioner, let's start all over again. So good to see you again. Thank you for the excellent okay. job that you're doing. Um, which of the boroughs has the slowest response time, or the greatest response time citywide? Right, right now, the Bronx, followed closely behind by, uh, by Manhattan. Mm -hmm. The best response time is in Staten Island. What would be the purpose, or what would be the explanation for the borough of the Bronx a continuation of, of the uh, per capita need for our services and the lack of uh, a shortage in staffing that didn't allow us to fill all of the ambulance tours that we may have filled in the previous year. 
but those numbers, as we have hired more people and as we improve the uh, fly car program, we believe will come back into line with where they should be. And this has been historic. I believe well, year over year, the borough of the Bronx has had the greatest response, or the highest Why response. we instituted this program in the borough of the Bronx was because of the, the need. We, we felt that the Bronx was not being served as it should be uh, in correlation with the other boroughs and attempted to correct that, and we're still in the process of doing that. Do you believe the additional, I believe it's 10 fly car units will be sufficient? And this is only for EMS now, correct? This is EMS, yes. We will in add uh, eventually 17 fly cars and their um, corresponding BLS transport units. And we do believe that that will be sufficient in the Bronx um, and will bring their response times down considerably. Commissioner, and how long before we evaluate to see if there's additional need of resources? And obviously, I think the first additional fly cars will go in in October of, uh, of this calendar year. And an assessment will be made relatively in a short period of time to determine if there are additional resources we in the long-term approach. We should see improvements right away. And then long-term approach would be permanent structures? Is well, we, we may need more stations in the Bronx. Is that, as we add resources, our stations are considerably crowded. And then you go back to one of the fundamental questions. And there is funding as, uh, for station in the Bronx. Right. And the, for the primary question is here, why the borough of the Bronx? What makes it so different from the rest of the city that you can I, see I think it's, it was per capita demand increasing at a higher rate than the other boroughs, so that um, the population of the Bronx as opposed to the other boroughs, re required more ambulance calls per person than any other borough. And we did not have the staffing to put enough units there to cover that increase, ever-increasing demand. I'm sorry to hear that you don't have enough staffing, but I, I would imagine this would be a priority that we would use whatever limited resources we do have available. And we had, you know, we had prioritize uh, to the borough of the Bronx where obviously the need is higher and the response rates are higher. We, we had five tactical units we added to the borough of Bronx. We also have an issue because of, um, you know, the Bronx is not full of hospitals and the turnaround time when we bring people to the hospitals, it is the longest of any of the boroughs also, which takes more time to get our units back in service. And part of that is because the uh, ERs uh, in the Bronx are as busy as they are anywhere in the country. So I'm glad that you brought that up in the chair if you allocate me a, a little bit of grace time here. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And those two ERs will just use two in particular, uh, maybe one be in Jacoby Hospital and the other be in Montefiore Hospital, Albert Einstein. Lincoln. Yeah, Lincoln. But I'm going to use these two as a prime example. And one of the concerns, and why I bring them up is, we're recently looking at a, this administration in, initiating Vision Zero road dieting for Mars Park where we're going, just to familiarize you with the road diet plan, where you take two driving lanes and you create one driving lane so you can create left turns and whatnot. Uh, this is all part of the, this administration's vision zero approach. This would be a concern where we already have the highest rate of response time citywide. And if you're gonna narrow a major corridor that leads to both hospitals, Jacoby and Einstein, this is going to increase the amount of time that your units can get to those ERs, and we know that seconds and minutes make a difference in many cases. What are your thoughts? I, I don't know if we've reviewed that particular project yet, but we do look very closely at any uh, s similar projects and how they would affect our ability to respond. So. Um, I'm not sure if we've looked at that one. Yeah, well, I would, we would have some concern. 
we're working through this, and we currently have a temporary stay. I actually had to go to court to get one. This is an important part of the argument that was made by the community, that leading to these two hospitals, you will have a road diet plan implemented that will delay the time that you get to the emergency room. And what, which, what road is this? Which, which? Morris Park Avenue. Morris Park Avenue. Sure. And it's a stretch of a mile and a half that will be converted from two driving lanes to a single lane. And I'd really like to take this up with you to make sure that we don't make a mistake. We'll be glad to uh, discuss that with, with And I'm grateful staff. to you for acknowledging that these are areas of concern that would, should involve the EMS and fire department and other uh, first responders when it comes to where these road diets are implemented citywide and for the in the best interest of New Yorkers. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the discretion. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, with that, we're going to end this hearing. I thank you all for coming in and giving us testimony. Uh, we'll follow up with questions later on. Uh, this hearing is adjourned at 420 in the afternoon. Thank you.